Welcome to the Swirl Suite, guys. Happy Wine Wednesday. It's me and Tanisha today. Hey, Tanisha. Hey. How are you? (laughs) (laughs) I'm good. (laughs) Wonderful. So we are joined with a very special guest today. Mr. Stephen Lane, how are you? Hi, Sarita. Hi, Tanisha. I'm doing very well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to your podcast. Thank you for joining us. And you were just telling us where you are located. Please tell tell everybody where you're located today. Yes, well, in addition to being a wine enthusiast, I'm also a hotelier, and I'm currently based in Penang, Malaysia, an island state off the coast of uh, Malaysia. So I'm here for three months on assignment. Uh, Normally, I'm working with Pan Pacific Hotels Group in Singapore. So I've been in Singapore for the past five years. Yeah, it's a very inspirational place to write. (laughs) And a cool way to see different places and like to see the world. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I've worked in hotels all my life and uh, got into the wine uh, side of things through hotels and restaurants and bars, banqueting. Mm -hmm. And I've always used different cities where I live in as my base. So when I lived in London, I traveled around Europe and that's where I got introduced to wine. And then I lived in Dubai for a while. So I traveled around the Middle East. Now that I'm based in Singapore, I'm traveling around Asia as much as I can. So uh, before we go any further, for those who do not know who you are, please do a formal introduction of who you are and what you do. Sure. My name is uh, Stephen Lane. I'm the author of the wine-fueled suspense thriller, Root Cause, and I'm a hotelier as my my day job. (laughs) So I've been doing that for the last 20 years, working working around the world in five-star hotels. And that's how I got involved in the wine industry, uh, buying and selling wines for restaurants and banqueting and getting involved in wine dinners and meeting winemakers through the hotel industry, essentially. And this is not your first novel. No, this is my third novel. I've written two other ones. One's called Lethal Suggestions. It's a medical thriller based on multiple personality disorder and based in San Francisco. And then I wrote another one called Iconoclast, a Dan Brown type uh, religious conspiracy thriller. Root Cause is the first novel I've had traditionally published, though. So it's not an easy industry to break into. So, but thankfully, I found a great uh, agent and a great editor and a great publisher who took a chance on Root Cause, and it's been doing very, very well since then. So now that I've written uh, Root Cause in this wine-centric niche novel, I've decided to write another novel in the same industry. So part of the uh, Steve, Steve Lane Wine Universe. Uh, <laughs> no competition to MCU, I can guarantee you. <laughs> but I'm working on a second wine novel now called Dragon Vine and already outlining the third wine novel to come after that. So there will be recurring characters in all three novels. Well, that's exciting. And Tanisha, you have not read the book yet, but you have it. I I have it. I just got my copy. Oh, great. Fantastic. Okay. Right. So don't spoil it. it. With what we (laughs) ask you on the interview, like don't spoil it. Don't say what happens at the end. Or yeah, or just say spoiler alert, and then I'll like cover my ears. (laughs) Okay. Well, I can promise you, wine is safe, so don't worry. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So, have you always been a writer? I've been writing since university. Yes. Uh, So, ever since I was in, yeah, I guess around nineteen or so. And just always enjoyed the process. And it's a difficult uh, pursuit in some ways because it takes a lot of time, a lot of patience. Uh, It doesn't make you a lot of money. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. you really have to be passionate about it. So hence the reason I got into the hotel industry and kept on working in hotels. I didn't want to wake up and think I was a struggling actor or a barista, still trying to be uh, the the, the great novelist. uh, (laughs) So, uh, But I've I've always enjoyed writing. And even though, um, yeah, it's not been paying greatly or anything, I'm still going to continue writing. And if one day it takes off and I get uh, successful and uh, it actually can start paying the bills, that'd be fantastic. But if not, that's not the point of it. The point is the pure joy of it, the the passion involved, and pursuing a story that the characters draw you into. Can I ask a really silly question? What is a hotelier? (laughs) Oh, just somebody who manages a hotel, somebody who works in hotels. (laughs) Oh, okay. But so, and you travel and manage hotels or you stay, usually stay put? I usually stay put. I've worked for different hotel companies like Hilton, Marriott, Ritz. I'm now with a Pan Pacific group, which is based out of uh, uh, Singapore, but they have a hotel in Seattle. They've got hotels in Canada as well, where I'm from originally. And I've worked my way up through the hotel industry. So working in kitchens, working in rooms, working in front desk. And now I'm hotel manager of an 800 bedroom hotel in Singapore and on assignment here in Penang, helping them manage a hotel here. Got it. So can you tell us, can you tell us about your connection to wine and how that started? Sure. Uh, I joined the uh, Grosvenor House Hotel 
in London in the banqueting department, uh, got back in 2002. And just by chance, that, that, that role happened to be in charge of the wine list, which I wasn't aware of. So on my second week, they basically said, okay, you need to do the wine list. We sell about $40 million worth of wine every year, American. Uh, so you need to do the wine list and put this together. <laughs> so I learned very quickly. Um, and I met uh, lots of wine suppliers. And through that, I was able to visit Bordeaux, Burgundy, Champagne, uh, get some really great trips to go see the houses and the chateau where they made the wines, which is just incredible. And I was invited to a lot of tastings and dinners, so to put together the, the best possible wine list and beverage list for the hotel, for the customers. So through that, I started meeting with customers. They started asking for tastings and notes on the wine. So just yeah, by serendipity, I fell into it and had to become an expert very, very quick. <laughs> yeah, it's been a, been a great, uh, great experience, and I haven't looked back since. Yeah, I love hearing about people with kind of a, a little more non-traditional career paths and things, oh. things that they don't talk to you about in school. You know, school, they're like, oh, be a teacher, a lawyer, a doctor. It's like, <laughs> no, I'm going to be a hotelier. That's what I'm well, my, my dad's a doctor. My mom's a nurse. And I'm sure at one point they said I should get into hospitals. And I probably heard, I think I misheard a hospitality. Right. You're like, no. But uh, no, it doesn't it doesn't pay well to begin with. The hours are very, very long. It can be a pretty brutal job in some ways. You deal with uh, some wonderful customers, but some not so wonderful customers sometimes. <laughs> uh, but but if you, if you work hard and stay stick with it, it can be very rewarding in future. As I said, you get to travel. There's opportunities to drink wine and champagne at different receptions, which is great. And you meet a lot of wonderful people in the industry, guests and associates, uh, colleagues alike. Yeah, that's one thing I definitely can say about, you know, being partially in the hospitality industry myself. The people yeah. that you're able to meet um, is just amazing. Yeah, uh, just it's incredible. Yeah, and, from all different yeah. walks of life and different cultures and yeah and it's it's weird sometimes because you meet these people they're amazing and then you know they leave because you know they don't live at the hotel they go back no, exactly home, you know whatever yeah, exactly. so they come into your life for a week a few days and then leave and you know just leave an impression on you um and you know that's just kind of a cool thing it's yeah Oh yeah, it's incredible. And th this is how I actually ended up meeting with uh, Joel Peterson, who's the head winemaker and founder of Ravenswood Wines in Lodi, California. Yeah. So he was, he was doing, he was showing off his wines at a wine tasting in London. So I met him in one of these tasting environments and we got started chatting and he told me about this book called The Botanist and the, and the Vintner. And this is, an, this is a book, a, fiction, a, fi a nonfiction book by Christy Campbell. And it essentially recounts the whole uh, story of how phylloxera went from America all the way over to Europe and devastated the world's vineyards. So being a bit of a conspiracy theorist and a lover of uh, good thrillers, I thought to myself, well, what if that were to happen again? What if, and why would it happen? So that's how I came up with the idea of root cause. So guys, uh, if we can pause for just a second, we have another guest who has joined us. Hi, this is Leslie. Hey, Leslie. How are you doing? Good, how are you? I am we have good. Another guest. This is Leslie Freelo. She is also a, a regular host of the Swirl Suite. Hi, Leslie. This is Steve Lane here. Nice to meet you, Steve. Very nice to meet you as well. Hey, Quiet Storm. <laughs> <laughs> Hello there. So, Stephen, um, my next question for you was, so how did you do... I mean, you already know about wine. You've traveled to all of these places. Did you do any specific research for your book, Root Cause? Uh, definitely. Yeah. As you mentioned, I've, I've had the great fortune to be able to travel around the world quite a bit. And as I traveled, I wrote different chapters. So when I was in uh, Bordeaux and in Champagne, I actually wrote those chapters. When I was in South Africa, I did the research firsthand and really got to know the country and the, the wine scene, which is great. But I did a lot of research just online, of course, and through books. Uh, chatting with wine mate, my winemakers too, and I, I do studies as well in wine. So I recently completed the uh, French Wine Scholar uh, mm, nice. program here in uh, in Singapore. So I just need to do the exam to finish that off. And I study uh, with WSET, the Wine and Spirit Education Trust. So I finished level three last year, and I've started level four, but I put it on pause just because of writing it, promoting one novel, writing another, and then outlining a third, and having a two jobs in two different countries is a bit overwhelming right now. So <laughs> I'm focusing on the writing and the working and the studies are on pause right now, but I, I love learning about wine and, and reading about wine. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's very, yeah, it's a, a passion, a pr pr pursuit of passion really. So Steve, this is Leslie. What was the motivation for you to, um, to write the novel? 
Okay. Well, I've always been a big fan of writing. I've been writing for about 20 years now, and I've written two novels previously. So when I came up, when I read a, a book called The Botanist and the Vintner by Christy Campbell, upon the recommendation of Joel Peterson, the head winemaker of Ravenswood, I thought, oh, what a great, uh, what a great concept. I mean, I can't believe this happened, but what for it to happen again? So a lot of people don't know that history. Uh, so I thought this would be a great way to turn a, uh, uh, past uh, tragedy into a modern day conspiracy story. So I uh, just ended up coming up with the characters for that and how that would happen and came up with the story for Root Cause. And I, I, I was a history major when I studied in university. So so it's, it's great. All of my passions have kind of come together to create this uh, this world, as I was saying earlier, the Steve Lane wine universe. <laughs> so I'm working on a couple uh, wine novels right now to tie into Root Cause. Some of the characters will be recurring. Um, but yeah, I can use my passion for history, for wine, for writing, and bring it all together. So if one day I can monetize that and actually make some money, I'll, I can retire and just continue writing all my life. <laughs> but no, I won't quite pay the bills. Writer, writers don't get paid a lot. <laughs> so does it? Um, I've heard um, other authors like each time when they sit down to write a new book, it kind of the characters stick with them and they kind of write their own story. Is that how it works for you? When um... uh, yes, absolutely, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Characters have a way of actually taking a story in directions you you don't re you don't uh, you don't predict, and also sometimes in, in ways you don't want them to. You're like, hey, come back here. The story's over here. What are you doing? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They really take on a life of their own, but that's the that's the most exciting part about writing. You create this story, you create this world, you create this uh, universe of characters, and they just start doing their own things. And if if you develop them well and have them really firmly planted in your mind, it's easy to write dialogue because you know what, you know what they're going to say, you know what they're going to do, uh, you know what their reaction would be if somebody pushed them in the pool. I, mean, I heard that somewhere. So there, it's it's really fun. And if you if you have great characters and a story you're passionate about you can't not sit down and write. The story is saying, hey, I'm not written yet, finish me, let's go. So it's great to have that, that drive, that desire behind a story, that passion. Uh, so that's how I've always tried to approach my books. Because if, if I'm not interested in it, if I'm getting bored, of course my readers won't be enjoying it as well. Can you hear me now? Yay, we can hear you. Yes. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I thought I had the technical difficulties worked out. I'm sorry. That's okay. Awesome, we're happy to have you. Oh, I'm so glad to be here, thank you. Hi, good morning, Allison. This is Steve Lane, author of Root Cause. How are you? Hi, Stephen. It's so nice to uh, be able to put a voice with the words that I was uh, reading because I feel like I can hear your voice in that. We've we've exchanged some um, Instagram uh, photos yes. and, and yeah. all. So. Well, I really appreciate you reading Root Cause and I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> I sure did. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Were there any elements of it that you enjoyed in particular? So I don't know if you remember the tweet, but there was a tweet. I, I did it on both my professional, my work account, which has nothing to do with wine, and my wine account. But my husband at one point said, I don't know why you keep reading these things to me. I can't figure out if you're the character in reading. I recall that. Clearly, the, you seem to uh, capture how I talk about wine and what I think about wine because he was not quite sure if I was sharing with him or if I was actually commenting on the book. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a, there is a universal wine speak out there, isn't there? <laughs> so, there sure is. <laughs> it, uh, we all speak the same way and people, people outside the industry probably think we're crazy. <laughs> well, and I saw, so I saw that you were um, at a writing retreat. Does that mean we're going to get to see some more of um, our favorite characters? Uh, hopefully, yes. Well, yeah, definitely, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm based in Penang, Malaysia right now, uh, but I took a, a short four-day break to a place called Kota Kinabalu, which I didn't know existed three weeks ago. And then when I went there, I really enjoyed it and stayed at a great hotel where I was able to write for four days straight. So I try to do this every few months, just get out of the city or out of the country and just out of my, my little world and write in my own place where I can just concentrate. So I'm working on a book, a second book in the wine, Steve Lane Wine Universe, and it's called Dragon Vine, uh, based on an ancient Chinese grape variety. So I won't say any more, but there are some recurring characters from Root Cause. And what happens in Root Cause and what happens in Dragon Vine start to feed the storyline for my third wine novel that I'm outlining already. Oh, wow. That's exciting. Steven, yeah, do you so. drink while you write? <laughs> Absolutely not. That would be a disaster. Oh. 
<laughs> no, I think you'd see the quality of my writing uh, uh, yeah, plummet quite quickly. No, <laughs> when, when I write, I need, my, I need to be focused, and so I usually drink tea or coffee or Coke Zero. Uh, uh, drinking for me is when I'm spending time with friends out dining or when I'm just enjoying uh, some Netflix or something. So but I find that uh, drinking alcohol, it, I mean, it, it is a depressant, right? So it kind of slows my mind down, so I prefer to be really uh, jazzed on tea or coffee and I'd be able to write that. <laughs> it might depend on what you're writing. I think there was someone who their quote was uh, drink while you write, but edit sober, like write drunk, ah, but edit sober or something like that. That's probably a good idea, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, certainly if, if I had wine, um, drinking wine, I, I can, I can uh, ideate a lot more. So that's where a lot of my creativity will come. So if I'm writing and drinking, then it's more, I tend more to outline chapters or to think of new ideas and concepts as opposed to the actual writing and uh, the editing afterwards. <laughs> Wait, so I've, that question is for everybody. Do, does everybody drink while they write? Am I the only one? What are we uh, writing? Oh, we're, you have a blo well, blog. Well, you, not so much. Anymore, <laughs> like, uh, what? <laughs> Allison, do you drink while you write? Uh, if, I'm, if I'm writing about wine, I'm always drinking wine. Okay, got it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, same here. I like that answer. I think I might just always be drinking, so maybe I. Yeah, I <laughs> so you just need to start writing. Right. And, um, <laughs> voila. <laughs> well, that's the great thing about tasting notes. You have to drink while you write. So, so doing tasting notes is always fun. <laughs> yeah. I try to spread a few tasting notes throughout the the novel, so it'll be a few more of those in the next book as well. When, when I write, I try to make sure the book is appealing, not only to, to, uh, to us winos and uh, wine geeks, cork dorks, but also to the regular layperson. So it's a fine balance between trying to find uh, what's interesting to people who don't know much about wine, but not so, I don't want to bore people who know about wine. So it's finding that balance of making it really intriguing, uh, educational, but not so esoteric that non-wine drinkers will think, oh, I don't understand what's going on. <laughs> yeah, so far, so far, I think we've reached that balance. I think that that was one of the things because I, I actually shared the book with a couple of friends who are not in wine at all. They kind of look to me to guide their wine experiences, but it is that's actually one of the things so interestingly, that's one of the things that they mentioned to me was that they enjoyed that about the book that if they had wine questions, they could come to me, but they didn't feel like they needed to actually get an answer to those to understand where the story was going. So Okay, great. Yeah, I didn't want to be too luxury, uh, but at the same time, I wanted to get some certain points across because I, I love reading books that educate you at the same time as entertain you. So just having that balance there between education and uh, entertainment, essentially. Right. I had a question about the characters, the main characters, Corvina and Brian in the book. Without giving yeah. out any spoilers, are they... Right. Don't have me fight you. <laughs> are the characters based on anybody in your life? Uh, not wholly, no. Cer cer certainly elements um, from people I know and even from myself, including my sense of humor, uh, are in my characters. But I, I never look at somebody whole cloth and think, okay, I'm going to take that person and make that person a character. Uh, there's all sorts of defamation lawsuits and libel I'm sure I'd run into if I did that. So I try to avoid that. Also, I like to create characters out of uh, thin air in a sense and then and build them up throughout the story as well. So it's a lot more fun that way. And yeah, just avoid the risk of people thinking, oh, you wrote about me. I can't believe you did that. So I'll use last names I know of, maybe people I know, but there's never any real connection between that and the person. So there, there's enough different personalities out there and quirks out there that you don't need to copy and paste uh, somebody's personality in the wine industry. <laughs> I like the fact that um, you have a wine background. So, you know, sometimes when you are reading a novel or um, people are referencing like a certain era or a, a particular industry. And so it's not always factually accurate, even though the novel is really entertaining. And so the fact that you're able to blend the two um, is great. So like, Allison said that for those people who are not um, wine professionals, they still can enjoy the book without feeling like it was more of um, like a professional manual. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, that, you're right. That can be so jarring if you're reading a book and, you're, and you know something about the industry and you see that the author just gets it wrong. It just, it just stops you and it kind of it destroys their credibility. And I remember reading a book. I used to work at the Ritz Hotel in London, so very fortunately, and I read a book uh, and one of the chapters was based there and they were describing the interior and I thought, this person has never been to my hotel. <laughs> and it just, just destroyed the credibility of the story. 
So it's, uh, it's very hard to keep all the details straight and get everything right. There, there's a couple of minor, minor things in the book that I, I didn't quite nail, which I'll address in my next book and make sure I get right. Um, but yeah, it's certainly reassuring to have people who are in the wine industry read the novel and, and say, hey, great job. I'm really happy with that. And I was lucky just recently, uh, a master of wine, Greg Sherwood, who is a South African, London-based master of wine, he'd read the novel and he posted a great review on his blog, uh, gregsherwood.com, I think it is. And so I was really, really happy to see that people who are really professionals in this industry are reading it and resonating with the story and its characters and enjoying the, the thrill of the, of the read. So I was wondering, do you think that social media has made any of that more difficult? I mean, you've obviously reached out to the social media side of things in terms of here you are, you have a bunch of wine bloggers and um, podcasters and YouTubers who have read your book. Um, you have a great Instagram following, but in terms of trying to keep that reality, um, how, how has that influenced um, your writing and whether or not your authenticity and, and all that? Well, thankfully, the, the blogosphere, the Instagram world, uh, everybody's very positive, or certainly in relation to my book, everybody's been very, very positive. So it's just been tremendous to see that. So I haven't really, I haven't had any negative comments on the novel. Uh, people, and if people don't like it, they've kind of kept it to themselves. So the review, reviews have been very flatteringly, overwhelmingly positive. So I'm just thrilled about that. Um, and the, yeah, the world of social media has been fantastic for the book. I mean, in what day and age would you be able to write something and all of a sudden somebody with 30,000 followers on Twitter or Instagram is posting a picture of it. <laughs> so it's been tremendous to tap into the, the world of Instagram and wine lovers, hashtag Bordeaux, hashtag champagne, hashtag all these wonderful <laughs> hashtags that they have out there. Uh, Twitter has been great as well. I've got my own Facebook page and set up a website. Um, but, you know, it's just fantastic because you get to meet so many different people from around the world and it's, it's gotten a, a global following. Uh, so it's been yeah, just wonderful to tap into all of that. And certainly I try to respond to everybody personally and share, reshare, repost everything that people put on there as well, just to yeah, help spread the word and share the, the positivity of the, the story. Stephen, where can everybody find Root Cause? Okay. Well, it's available in select bookstores and online everywhere. So Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, uh, QBD in Australia, Kinokinoya in Asia, uh, Waterstones in the UK. So all good bookstores uh, should have. And if they don't, you can always order it, of course. But online, you can get it too. And it's available in electronic format, uh, Kindle, and uh, any other format you want to download, essentially. Is there anything, I just have a quick question. When you sure. were writing this, or even now since it's been released, Stephen, is there anything that like you really wanted people to take away from this or something that you're like, I want people to really know this about wine or know this about my writing that you want them to get from um, Root Cause? Wine is important. <laughs> <So>. Yes. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the sheer love of wine, uh, I want you to be able to share my passion for wine. I mean, I, I haven't put in a story yet, but I'd love to put in a story, a character talking about wine, where, it's, where he or she says something like, wine, it's culture, it's history, it's geography, it's geology, it's biology, it's chemistry. What facet out there it does, in discipline does wine not touch? And how does, I mean, wine connects us in so many different ways. And being a history major, uh, so, certainly I see just so many great wine stories out there from from the Last Supper to uh, the, the wines of World War II that were stolen by uh, Hitler and his, his uh, armies as they marched across Europe. I mean, there's just so much history that wine interweaves with. So there's so many great ideas potentially for stories there. And I'm hoping that I can write, write another couple of wine novels before somebody else catches on to this wonderful niche of wine thrillers yeah. that really yeah. nobody, nobody seems to have tapped into. If you Google yeah. wine books, there's, there's certainly some great wine books out there, and I've tried to read, I've tried to read them all, but there isn't really a, a wine thriller, so I'm hoping this is a, a bit of a niche for me, that I can be the, the wine novelist, a wine thriller writer, and continue to have these characters share their passion with the world. Okay, I'm here for that. And also, if you need a name for that character that says all those things, T-A-N-I-S-H-A. Oh, and this is, this is a great variety, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you, wow. you might end up in a story one day who knows <laughs> who knows <laughs> so I, did have one, I did have one other question which is probably a sign of how my book club tends to go versus more than anything else have you thought about um putting at the end of your book any sort of book club notes or 
these questions or things we should be thinking about. I, mean, I my my book club likes to think that it's a book club, but it's a book <laughs> club where you occasionally read a book. Um, yeah. But so your club actually finishes a book. Oh, my club is a drink club. <laughs> you bring a book. <laughs> <laughs> if I said it was a wine thriller, <laughs> something more serious, probably not. So. <laughs> but I uh, know, to be honest, I haven't had, I hadn't thought of that yet. Uh, this, but the publishing industry is all very new to me, so I'm learning everything as I go along. Uh, but I've got a great publicist called Kelsey in California, who's been tremendous. Uh, my agent Stephen in New York has been wonderful. And I've got an editor, David Groff, who's just been great. And uh, the publishing team at Turner Publishing have been very, very helpful in guiding me through the process. So what's exciting is now that I've learned all that, to be able to then apply that to the next novel. I should just be able to write faster and faster and get more and more out there. So that's certainly something I'll take into consideration for next time. Yeah, throw these uh, questions into the book and have that available for book club readers. So thanks for the tip. I appreciate that. Yeah, I just, I, I know we, my book club is a wine Slash book club, so it seems to fit well. So, so, so maybe if I next time provide ch suggestions of what wine to drink with each chapter. Oh, you actually would have a whole lot of fans with my book club if you did that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they never make it through the chapter; they just discuss the wine. So what did yeah. you think about that? The, the reviews too? might be a bit slower coming out too. <laughs> they might be, but they, you know, they might also be a little more verbose. So you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So what kind of questions were your book club looking for or any questions that came up that uh, you thought were particularly resonating? So it was, so actually I, there were, because um, they're not necessarily wine people, there were some just questions in general about phylloxera and mm -hmm. was it real or was that imaginary and kind of trying to give them a little bit of wine background there. Um, okay. And what would, what would really happen if phylloxera really was that pervasive and yeah, well, that's a terrifying thing, and I mean, it's and it's shocking when you read the story to realize how devastating it really was. I mean, it it, it wiped out Europe's vineyards, and to this day, the only solution to preventing it is still grafting American rootstock onto uh, European vines. So the threat is very real, and that's why I thought the story was really fun because it could happen again, and if it did, it would just be devastating. I mean, not, not just to, to wine lovers and we lose our wine, but it, the industry out there, the number of people that rely on that uh, that industry, that business to make money, to make a living is, I mean, they're in millions. So it's it wouldn't be a small thing if the world's vineyards were at risk again. No, that's for sure. Um, the other thing they were asking was why I didn't bring Poop Clico since it was my <laughs> book. So that was on, that was on well, me, not on you. <laughs> fair enough. Well, I mean, the wonderful thing about wine is how subjective it is. Uh, I mean, I personally still haven't really gotten into Burgundy, which I know some of my wine snob friends kind of look at me and say, what, Steve, you want a Bordeaux? Why? <laughs> you should be drinking La Tache or whatever. Uh, so, no, it's so subjective. And it, it, that, that's what makes it so fun. We all have our own opinions. And none of them are wrong necessarily. It's just it's a subjective uh, field. So if you, you just love and enjoy wine. And there's a chapter in a story where uh, one of the characters, he's an auctioneer and master of wine. His name is Max, and he's he's trying to seduce this young woman and telling him telling her about wine essentially, and he's essentially saying wine is like music, and I think it's the same. When you go and enjoy music, nobody says, "Oh, I don't know anything about music." Well, it doesn't matter. You just enjoy what you enjoy, and the same should apply to wine. You don't have to know everything about wine. Just enjoy what you enjoy, and if you enjoy Spumante, if you enjoy Verplico, if you enjoy Latache, go ahead and enjoy it, and become maybe a bit of a expert in that area. Don't try to focus too much on learning everything about wine throughout the history of the world. Just enjoy the, the wine that you enjoy. And that could be a, a white Zin Fandel or it could be uh, yeah, something from Bordeaux, Saint-Julien or the Medoc. And so, yeah, just enjoy what you enjoy. Love, love wine for what it is. I like that uh, metaphor, the relating it to the music. I'm going to use that now. Yeah. Like people don't yeah. say, like, oh, I don't know that much about music. You just listen. And you're like, yeah, I like this. Yeah, I don't. And you'll try new music and you'll listen to new music and seek out new music. Do that with yeah. mine too. I'm using that. Exactly. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> so, I thought of that a long time ago and it just really resonated with me. Because with music, you don't necessarily Google the history of the artist and every single song they ever wrote and try to understand how they wrote it, why they wrote it, and the emotion behind it. And the same with wine. You don't need to do that to appreciate it. Just appreciate it for what it is. So, Stephen, in this part of the show, 
We yeah. will ask you five random questions. And actually, okay. these questions are for everybody because everybody writes here. So <clears throat> first question is, what do you need to write? Um, that can be an environment, food, drink, music, whatever. What do you need to write? Thankfully, just time. I, I've trained myself to be able to write anywhere and everywhere. So I, I, I make voice notes or little notes on my uh, notes on my, on my, on my iPhone. Uh, I can write in an airport. I just need time and a bit of peace and quiet, really. So uh, ideally, I've got a writing retreat where I can write for four days straight <laughs> out on the beach somewhere. But uh, otherwise, I, I didn't write anywhere, really. So what I try to do at home is go out of go out to uh, whether it's a hotel or a restaurant, find a quiet corner and just write there, so there's no distractions. That's helpful. Um, but yeah, just some some tea and coffee in a quiet place and a laptop or my iPad, and I can write away. And once I get into the story, the world just disappears around me. Mm -hmm. So people can be a little uh, put off by that, <laughs> but it's a great way to write. Uh, but you just need time, really. And I, I never get writer's block. I don't really understand what that is or how that is. Because if again, if, as I mentioned earlier, if your story is so compelling to you and your characters are so well developed and they have that passion, that that drive to move forward, that motivation, that mystery to solve, what's stopping you? I mean, it should, it should write itself almost. And that's what happens. Allison, what about you? Uh, usually I need the good wine for inspiration since most of my <laughs> writing is about the wine specifically. Um, and and then actually the time, I usually find that the difficulty is finding the time to sit down and do it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tanisha and Leslie, what about you guys? To write? Have we talked about this? <laughs> <laughs> I just need wine. So there. That's it? Okay. I feel like I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're the professional here. <laughs> right, we're the funny. only published author here. <laughs> Right, that's not like you might not be doing it wrong. You actually have to do it the right way. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Leslie, what about I, you? I um time, definitely time. But I I find when I don't focus on it <clears throat> and I just take notes like I'm like I'm thinking about it on the metro or what have you, then when I sit down to write, it's more free flowing. Mm -hmm. But if I just sit there in front like go okay you need to write on this topic or this is the topic it takes longer for me to do it okay you know it's for me i need wine and music um the silence mm. is great but um i do um i find some motivation in certain types of music it's not quite jazz it's not quite r&b it's somewhere in the middle it's sort of like that zero seven for an exchange, for hero, if anybody knows the artists, they're yes. very sort of airy, so but has a beat. So music motivates me when I um when I write. All right, next question: Do you have a writing pet peeve? Um, my pet peeve is anything that slows me down. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that, and I, I love writing dialogue. I love writing action. So I like to get the story out first. And when people are char when characters are talking and there's conflict, the, the, the story just flows, the, the dialogue flows, it's fantastic. I just, sometimes I can't type fast enough. <laughs> and so anything that slows me down from that, and this will sound a bit funny, but sometimes the, the additional description in writing can be a, a bit of a pet peeve. When I've got to spend time describing what somebody's wearing or when I've got to spend time mm. describing the weather or the background. So occasionally I'll, I'll just write the dialogue straight through without a pause for error or the action. And then I'll go back and look and say, okay, where can I put in these interesting facts and talk about the, the weather, talk about the environment they're in, the color of the barn behind them, or the, the, the fleshiness of the grapes or whatever it may be, and making sure that all that is in the story within the dialogue and action without slowing down the pace. That can, be, that can be hard sometimes too. And it's why authors at the very beginning of each chapter quite often describe the weather and then get into the story. So they say, here's the scene, now here's the story. Got it. So anything that slows me down can be a bit of a pet peeve. So it's not that I don't do it. I don't like doing it. I just try to focus on writing the story first and then getting going back and filling in the details. And I hate being interrupted. Mm -hmm. Like like when I finally had the time, I and then, you know, something interrupts me, like I got to answer an email or I got to get up and go to an appointment. I hate that because I'm already, I'm in the groove. And so yeah. Yeah. then finding that again is a bothersome. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have a writing pet peeve? So maybe it's more of a reading pet peeve. Oh, sure. Um, I, it, 
I really don't like when there isn't an Oxford comma. And then <laughs> but I find that I sit there and I'm like, wait, what is the author trying to say to me? Are they trying to, like, and I sit there and I actually think about it. Like it literally triggers this weird thought process in my head every time, even when it's obvious. I'm like, wait, am I reading it correctly? And so, yeah. For the, for, the record, I'm a big fan. for the record, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of the Oxford comma. Uh, I follow the Chicago style uh, manual of uh, writing, which I believe does still allow for the Oxford comma. So I hope I wasn't a source of your pet peeves. <laughs> well, I actually really appreciated that they were in there because yeah. I really find it very distracting. And I know that I know that it's much more free flowing to not have it. But it just, I find it distracting when it's not there. Um, no, it has to be there. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's one of my writing pet peeves, not having the Oxford comma. <laughs> <laughs> See, now, now I knew I liked you, Stephen. <laughs> oh, good. Well, I appreciate that, Allison. Thank you. <laughs> what about yours, Sarita? I don't really have a pet peeve. Um, well, so this is bad. But sometimes me and Tanisha, we will share screenshots of like horrible sentence structures and tweets <laughs> and tweets and Instagram posts. <laughs> I'm sorry for putting us out there. Oh. No, you know grammar's my because I, I teach English, so like I can't. You, 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 I can't. I don't even have words. <laughs> so, um. <laughs> Oh, so um, I'm sorry, Tanisha. Um, so you know the um, <clears throat> president of the United States, like he oh, tweets God. often. Um, but it came out maybe six months ago that his he does have staff who tweet for them. <laughs> yes, and they purposely like will make spelling mistakes or grammatical mistakes to tweet in his voice this is so sad this is the saddest thing i've ever heard are you kidding me no i'm serious it was like it, it was an article in the washington post or something like that like it it was finally the white house admitted that um he doesn't write all his tweets but they the the writing staff was purposely you know they studied his Drinking style writing <laughs> right if they were drinking yes maybe they should be um but they study his style and so they purposely will tweet in his style mm. well i guess the thing to say about that is that if you ever wondered whether or not you could have voice in a tweet there is definitely he he a voice we we yeah. can, we can we can picture what that voice sounds like, for better or worse. Unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, funnily, funnily enough, uh, I, I, I read, I've read i written a couple of chapters, not a couple, a couple of chapters, a couple of paragraphs in his voice, uh, just playing with a story idea that I haven't uh, finalized yet. But yeah, I mean, his voice, his character, his style is so unique that when you read it, you think, oh my God, okay, this is, this is Trump. And the story I was thinking of, along with him, and maybe it'll fit into my next story. I mean, we're in a real possible situation that he could bring back prohibition. He doesn't drink. He's a teetotaler. What would stop him from saying, hey, let's go back to prohibition. Let's ban alcohol and the sale of alcohol and the consumption of alcohol and go back to a world where wine and alcohol doesn't exist. So that could be the next thriller out there. Who knows? <laughs> I was wondering if you were going to end up with something along those lines, um, considering you sort of hinted a little bit about there being a faction of... Um, yep. Yeah, the dries <laughs> in, yep. uh, in the story. And yeah. they were all in D.C. Like yeah. when, when we met most of them, they were in D.C. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah, there are groups out there who still want to bring back prohibition and have dry counties. And there are plenty of dry counties out there still. What I find, fasc what I find fascinating, if you go to uh, where they produce uh, Jack Daniels, um, Lincoln County, it's still a dry county. So where you it can is. Visit, yeah. mm -hmm. right, where you visit Jack Daniels, you cannot drink. <laughs> well. So prohibition, yeah, still a threat. And with, with Trump in office, it, it could happen again. Who knows? <laughs> Don't give me So that is definitely a thriller and a horror story. 
Oh, oh right. Yes. Mm-hmm. I don't even want to think about that. <laughs> yeah. oh. Well, I mean, you well, might have lots of company. Uh, we'll just fly to Paris and drink with you, Tanisha. <laughs> right. <laughs> you have to, because I would never come back. That's what Americans did in Prohibition anyway. And we can avoid the tariffs that way, too. <laughs> but they're wine from Europe. Yeah, they flew here in London. And, yeah, you know, that's how they got cocktail culture over there. Yeah. Yeah. Who liked it from Canada, where I'm from originally? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. yes. Drove it across the lake to get it over to places. Um, like <laughs> in, in New York and stuff. Yeah. So my next question is, what is your favorite book turned movie slash show? Um, I'm a big fan of Chuck Palahniuk, so the author of Fight Club. And I love David Fincher, Brad Pitt, uh, uh, so, so I thought they did a great job with that movie. It was a bit underrated at the theaters. Um, so, yeah, I love that. Uh, but with a, a novel or a book uh, turned movie soon, and not really at release, I'm really excited about is The Billionaire's Vinegar. And this is going to star uh, Matthew McConaughey. And it's a story of uh, Hardy Rodenstock, the, the wine fraud fraudster who sold uh-huh. fake wine. And it's to do with a couple of bottles of uh, supposedly fake uh, Thomas Jefferson Chateau Lafitte, if I'm not mistaken, from 1787. So there's a lot of uh, historical provenance issues there. And a very famous auction house in London had auctioned it off, and they got into a lot of trouble. So that's supposed to be a movie soon with uh, Matthew McConaughey. They announced uh, a few years ago. So hopefully it's still in production, and we'll see that soon. That's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Allison, what about you? I feel like you have an answer. Um. So my answer is probably not nearly as exciting as you, <laughs> as you would think. I'm probably pretty, um, I'm pretty mundane. I mean, if we're talking about kind of, I guess it probably also um, matters what you consider like books and all. Like I really like what they've done in the Marvel universe and taking the comic books and putting them. Uh, gotcha. at, like I do, I do think of, of all of that as being writing and putting it into a, um, movies so it's probably not as um, not as in- inventive as it should be I will say if you're talking about wine stuff though taking um, bottle shock as a oh that was great putting it into yeah. a movie like that was I'm excited about billionaires vinegar I haven't heard anything about it recently which makes me worried but um, yeah, exactly but uh, but if bottle but bottle shock did really really well so there's an audience out there for it so I, I, I hope it's still Percolating, fermenting. I hope it's still fermenting. I love it. <laughs> fermenting. Yes. <laughs> Leslie, what about you? Oh, okay. Come back to me. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Tanisha, do you have one? I don't. No, I'm okay. sorry. Um, Maya's gonna be crazy rich Asians. Oh, oh I again. love that. I watched yeah, it again this the, weekend. I, mm-hmm. yeah, the book was great and it's the movie was so beautiful and their was character so developments was great. I feel like they picked the best cast. I thought it was great. Well, you need to come visit me in Singapore where it was filmed. Oh, I've heard great it's things crazy. about Sing- Singapore. It's an incredible city state. Yeah, what they've done there is so amazing, so clean, so well organized. It's a very, very easy place to live. Expensive, but but very very nice. And what they show in the movie is exactly what it's like. Oh. It's not like they the best bits. That's what it's like everywhere. So it's a, it's a wonderful place to live. Oh. I would just fly over because I love. I mean, it was a great movie, but I love that open market scene mm-hmm. oh, yeah. in the, yeah, the in the stalls. in the food market. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah that, those are everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if any of you ever, ever make it over, call me up. Let me know. <laughs> well done. <For> sure. <laughs> if you could have anyone in the world, celebrity or not, read the story of your life, who would it be? Easy answer. Morgan Freeman. Ah, oh, that's I perfect. Mean, clearly. Perfect. I mean, clearly the only just, person. Yeah, you watch the Shawshank Redemption, and it's just incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible how, how it, his voice, his intonation. Yeah, I mean, just, just love everything about how he told that story. And I'm a huge fan of Stephen King. So, uh, yeah, it just really came well together. So definitely Morgan Freeman. That's it. Can he read everybody's life? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go next. Um, Mindy Kaling. I feel like me and her have a connection. I feel like she could read my story very well. Oh, I would like Maya Angelou. If nice. She was around to read my story. Very nice. Yeah. 
I'm just thinking about somebody who has a nice voice. Like, I'm not thinking personality or, like, who could inflect or tell jokes like I do or anything like that. Um, you probably don't know this person, but I listen to, you know, I listen to True Crime Podcasts. And so, mm-hmm. Phoebe Judge, the host of Criminal Podcasts. I know Podcast, Phoebe Judge, yeah. Mm-hmm. I would absolutely want her to read my story and tell me. <laughs> And interview people and everything. She has such a very her voice is amazing. I just want to listen to her. So, so that's funny. I thought this. I thought the same thing about people like the listening to the voice, but I actually did not pick a woman to read it. I um, I appreciate the Morgan Freeman um, the the Morgan Freeman mention because because I I could have gone there, but I actually I, I was thinking that having Vin Diesel read it, like listening to his. <laughs> I love it. There's, you got a great voice, yeah. He has a great voice. I, so, yeah, I think I would want him to read my story. Yeah. I might should have said a man. That might be the only way I can get a man actually in the story. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Yeah. I was just saying, Jeff Goldblum would be fantastic as well. So, he he's got a great voice. voice too. Yeah, that's a really nice one. Okay, last question: What is your favorite children? Favorite children's story, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> favorite children's story. Right. Um, like your favorite I, I love uh, I love reading Roald Dahl. Uh, so I, I I read The Witches when I was young and terrified me. Uh, so the the witches and anything by Roald Dahl. So the big friendly giant, James and a giant peach, just great stories. Probably not suitable for too young a child. <laughs> um, but funny enough, I was, I was researching him a little while ago. Um, he, he has got a great uh, plethora of books that he's written. And he actually wrote a short story called Taste. And it's about a blind wine tasting. So it's, it's worthwhile looking up. It's, it's only about 10 pages, very short. But it's a fun little blind wine tasting story called Taste by uh, Roald Dahl. So I quite enjoyed that. I'll go. Um... So I have two, um, The Giving Tree. Oh, that's I good. love that book. Um, makes me cry every time. And um, Green Eggs and Ham. Nice. I love Green Eggs and Ham. Dr. Seuss is a national treasure. <laughs> yes. Yes, and he has, if you ever have a chance, um, and you're in Amherst, Mass, he yep. has a museum there. It's a great oh, little museum. Really? Mm-hmm. So I have two as well, because um, I don't know if one of them is really a children's book. I don't know what we consider children's books, because mm-hmm. I don't have kids. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but um, Tales of the Fourth Grade, nothing. Um, mm-hmm. I, I remember reading, like my first grade teacher reading that, and it was one of the first times I really <clears throat> realized that I loved books, and I loved fiction and stories and and um kind of really connected with a character so um so tales of the fourth grade nothing and the other one is called the devil's arithmetic which is by janet yolen it's um the first time that i really understood that i liked um science i'm going to call it science fiction time travel um and it's the story of a little girl who goes back um, in time and relives the Holocaust. Oh and it's God. kind of, it, it's, it, was an, it was an amazing book. It's kind of weird talking about it with you guys because the only other time I've ever done your podcast is when we've talked about kosher wines. Um, and she's, it specifically all happens over Passover. And so every time we've talked, to it, talked about <laughs> stuff is um, over Passover and kosher wines. So I feel like I, I'm putting myself in a niche that I actually probably am not normally in, but, um, but if you haven't, the movie is terrible. So as much as I love Kristen Dunst, um, I did not like the movie, but if you have a chance to go back and read, um, read the devil's arithmetic, it was really good. I was a uh, curious George fan. I liked <laughs> oh, George. Mm-hmm. And I like the book Corduroy. You know Corduroy? <laughs> No. no, what's that about? Love corduroy. <laughs> yeah, corduroy was good. Um, little teddy bear. Yeah. Oh, I have to look that up. You gotta read it. Well, that was it for our questions. Um, 
<laughs> Stephen, before you go, please tell everyone where they can follow you. And one more time, tell everyone where they can find Brew Cause. Okay, well, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. We've got a website as well, so very easy to find me online. I ran under my own name, no pseudonym, no pseudonym or pen name or anything, so very easy to find Stephen with a V, dot Lane, L-A-I-N-E. And books can be found at select bookstores and anywhere online, essentially. So Amazon, Barnes & Noble, QBD, Kino Kinoya, and uh, Waterstones in the UK. So not hard to find. So hope everybody picks up a copy and enjoys it. And please drop me a line. Let me know what you think. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you. Well, Tanisha, Sarita, Leslie, Allison, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you and really appreciate your time and your support for Root Cause and my writing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you guys for organizing it. Sure. Thanks for joining us, Allison. Bye, guys.